Okay. Okay. Um, and so the, the Friends Community Center um, provides services and conducts research with substance using uh, men who have sex with men and also with transgender women. And um, Cadence and I just met about 10 minutes ago. Um, we've been collaborating via email over the past couple of weeks, but I'm really excited to um, open up a collaboration project with her in Western University. And um, she's very highly involved in public education. Um, she's completed um, almost 500 like trans 101 um, type trainings. And so we're very happy to have her join us and she'll be sharing um, a lot of her personal experiences um, as well as um, all of the um, great experience that she's had in working with this community. So um, I'm gonna take the first 10 minutes or so and just briefly introduce some of the general concepts about um, how cross-sex hormone therapies are used for gender dysphoria. And the first thing I want to kind of talk about, did any of you guys catch this Time Magazine cover? Have you seen it? So this, um, I believe, hit the newsstands around June, and it really thrust um, transgender issues really into the forefront of mainstream American dialogue. Um, and so, um, do any of you watch Orange is the New Black? Okay, a couple of you guys, great. So, um, and, and kind of piggybacking along that um, bandwagon, um, I've been fortunate enough to, um, I was asked to, um, write up a, a, an article that has just been released today um, in the California Pharmacist. It was just published today. I've got a copy of it up here if any of you guys would like to take a look at it. Um, you can see it afterward. But um, So this was just published in California Pharmacist along with one of my colleagues at the College of Pharmacy, Emmanuel Schwartzman. Um, and in that we talk about communication pearls for um, communication um, with um, transgender patients. Um, so the first thing that I want to do is just establish some definitions. So um, gender dysphoria is, a, is psychological distress that's caused when an individual's natal sex, the sex which they were classified or assigned at birth, is not congruent with the sex that they personally identify with and have their gender identity in. And so this diagnosis does need to be made by a mental health counselor. Um, before seeking any medical intervention and individuals who are seeking sex reassignment should it's recommended that they live as their desired sex for for at least a year um, due to um, some of the permanent effects that can result when these hormones are used. So the medical interventions that we'll be talking about are the first two that are here on this slide and that's, those are the cross-sex hormone therapies um, or CSHT. And for trans women, we can use estrogens as well as anti-androgens. And for trans men, um, testosterone through uh, androgen therapy can be utilized. We won't be talking about sex, reass um, sex reassignment surgery, but there are several options for sex reassignment surgery. Um, and those are all listed here. And there are also options available for adolescents who um, are just undergoing and are just starting with puberty. And um, use of these GnRH or gonadotropin releasing hormone analogs can delay the onset of puberty and can delay some of the formation of secondary sex characteristics that might be troublesome toward that adolescent. But we'll be focusing just on the cross sex hormone therapy today. So the first one we'll discuss is the estrogens. There are a couple oral preparations which are commonly utilized. Um, estradiol valerate, um, as well as the 17 beta estradiol. Um, we, in the past, um, like prior to the 1990s, another form of estrogen, which is used today currently in some birth control um, formulations, is the thionyl estradiol. And that's much more of a potent estrogen. It's about 15 to 20 times more potent than is the estradiol. And um, it was thought to result in some more cardiovascular adverse effects than does the currently utilized estradiol without sacrificing any of the beneficial effects um, on um, some of the physical characteristic changes. There are also intramuscular um, preparations which can be utilized. 
um, that provide more convenient dosing of just every other week um, or every week without having to take a pill every day. In addition to estrogens, um, we can also utilize anti-androgens, and there are three oral preparations. Um, spironolactone is probably the most commonly utilized one, and this one is um, an inhibitor of testosterone synthet synthesis. Um, there's also um, cipter uh, cipterone, <laughs> uh, ciproterone acetate, as well as finasteride. Um, and these are all work to block the um, effects of testosterone. With the um, ciproterone, it's a competitive antagonist of dihydrotestosterone. And finasteride inhibits the 5-alpha reductase, which converts um, the dihydrotestosterone. Um, and so it can result in some significant decreases of testosterone. And then the last four products which are on here are the gonadotropin-releasing hormone agonists. Um, and these uh, products work through the use of a negative feedback loop and inhibit the secretion of um, estrogen by the ovaries as well as um, testosterone by the testes. So we can utilize dual therapy um, in um, the feminizing hormones. So some of the physical effects that can be manifest are uh, decreased spontaneous erections. And uh, so in trans women who take these medications, they'll notice a reduced, a reduced volume of ejaculate and their sperm may no longer mature. Um, and so because of that, we do have, uh, have to assume sterility. Um, and so um, there is a possibility that there can be some sperm banking that's done before um, initiation of this therapy um, if um, the individual does wish to have children um, because we do have to assume sterility once we utilize these hormones. But we also do need to be aware of the fact that pregnancy can still occur through vaginal intercourse, uh, unprotected vaginal intercourse. And so um, even though the we assume sterility, it's not a guarantee. And so we would want to counsel on appropriate birth control during vaginal intercourse. Um, also, patients may not be able to achieve a full erection after pro um, um, prolonged use of these hormones. And so they may not be able to achieve penetration. And these trans women will also experience a reduce a reduction in their sex drive as well. The second thing that's listed here is reduced testicular size. It might decrease by about half, um, but they'll still need to undergo routine checkups to make sure that there's um, no cancers or anything like that, just as a natal male would. There's an increase in the ratio of body fat to muscle mass. And um, so fat is redistributed from the buttocks, hips, and thighs, and is um, uh, it's 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 redistributed from the abdomen onto the buttocks, hips, and thighs. And so patients may also notice reduced muscle mass in the upper body, but this is reversible if um, we were to discontinue use of hormones. This, these changes might take some time to occur. It might take um, you know, between one to five years, about five years to really see the final effects of it. Also breast size will increase. Um, but due to the anatomic differences of the thorax in natal males, the size of the breasts may not be satisfactory to that trans woman. So you might expect to have like an A cup or, you know, the possibility of a B cup, um, perhaps. Um, there's also the possibility of a galactorrhea, which is a milky discharge that might result. And so anytime that happens, um, that's sort of an expected side effect, but you want to get that checked out by the doctor in case it's caused by some other um, process. And um, the final thing I've listed here is body and facial hair changes. So the body hair will become less noticeable, it will grow more slowly, but it won't stop completely. Um, and this is also reversible. Um, so if the hormones are stopped, then it might um, return. 
Now, if there was any male pattern baldness that was present prior to hormone therapy initiation, that's probably not going to stop and the hair certainly won't grow back. Um, and so these changes on, on body and facial hair do take the longest and the onset of, of these effects would be about six to 12 months after starting. There are some physical effects that are not changed by hormone therapy. Um, and these would be um, hair on the beard and mustache um, that will grow more slowly, certainly, but it's not going to go away. Um, the pitch of the voice will not rise, and the, um, also the Adam's apple will not shrink. So these are some of the effects that are not going to um, uh, be, be manifest through the use of the feminiz feminizing hormones. When it comes to safety, there's really so much of a paucity of data about the safety of these medications. With risk factor, um, I'm sorry, with um, bone fracture, um, there's a possibility that there might be um, a more of a risk of osteoporosis and bone fracture, and so we do want to check the bone mineral density in, in uh, these trans women who do have um, risk for osteoporosis. There's also, as you would imagine, with the use of estrogens, there's an increased risk of thromboembolism. And so there is sort of a contraindication about utilizing these estrogens in, uh, in women who have, trans women who have experienced like a venous thromboembolism or a VTE in the past. Um, although it's sort of like a soft contraindication because discontinuing the use of these may cause more distress and may actually put the woman at more of a risk um, um, just because of the psychological effects of withdrawing the hormones than any BTE would. Um, and so that's a conversation that needs to take place with the, with the physician. Um, cardiovascular disease, with the older preparation of the estrogen, which we don't utilize anymore, there was a 3.6 times more of a risk of cardiovascular disease and there's just not a whole lot of data with the newer estradiol preparations that are used. And so the, the thought is that we just need to monitor blood pressure, glucose, and lipids, um, just as you would any other person. And cancer rates do appear to be similar to natal male. And so um, we're going to recommend the same breast cancer screenings as we would for natal females and the same prostate screenings as we would for natal males because the prostate will still be present, and that is removal of the prostate is not something that would be considered in a sex reassignment surgery. And the, S, the androgens are a lot sim, simpler because it's really only one medication that we would use, and that's testosterone. There are several formulations that can be utilized, the oral, intramuscular, or topical preparations. And the physical effects that would be seen by the testosterone would be a voice de uh, deepening, and this is permanent, and it would generally occur within the first six months. Um, growth of facial and body hair, this is also permanent, and it will start within six months, but the full effects might take quite a bit of time, about five years. Cessation of menses will be seen fairly, free, uh, fairly soon, within one to six months of starting therapy. This is reversible, so if they were to stop taking the testosterone, menses could recur. Um, but again, just as with the trans women, for the trans men, we would assume sterility. And so that's just something that um, when patients consent to the use of this off-label therapy, they're going to have to recognize um, that the likelihood of becoming pregnant, while it's not zero, it is greatly diminished. Um, and so we would need to, um, you know, um, consider the possibility of egg harvesting, um, if there was any desire for uh, children in the future. Also, there can be a slight atrophy of breast tissue. Um, they, they really won't shrink all that much, but they might appear slightly smaller. Um, and just as the opposite with the, um, with the use of the feminizing hormones, we'll see a decrease of the body fat from the thighs, buttocks, and, um, and that will be placed onto the abdomen. Um, this can take up to 12 months to start to notice these effects, and the full effects may not um, be present until five years of therapy. And then um, clitoral enlargement can also um, take place. Typically, the clitoris would be about half an inch to a little bit over an inch in size, um, and this change would be permanent. 
And then some of the side effects of testosterone, which also would occur in men who are taking supplemental testosterone, could also be manifest um, in these trans men. And that would be acne, which is reversible after stopping the therapy, although there can be some permanent scarring that would occur through the acne, um, and also scalp alopecia, and this would be, would be permanent as well. So in regards to the safety of the androgens, these medications are a little bit um, safer than the estrogens would be. Um, so there's an unknown risk of bone fracture, just similarly with the estrogen, the feminizing hormones. Um, so we would check the bone mineral density. There's really limited data about um, the cardiovascular risk. Um, limited data does suggest that use of testosterone does worsen the lipid profile. Um, but whether that manifests in a, in a, you know, increase in heart attacks, strokes is something that's really um, an ongoing, uh, ongoing needs ongoing research. And similarly to to cancer rates, they do appear to be similar to natal females, um, but more data is really needed about the use of these um, um, androgens for this indication. So that's all of the um, preparation that, um, that I've done on just a brief intro to the use of these medications. But now I really want to get our guest speaker, Cadence Valentine, um, in, into this discussion here. So do I just click on her? Oh, cancel, screen share. Oh. cancel screen share. Cancel screen share. Okay. Yes. So um, if you could, we would really be interested in your personal story, um, in regards to how you made the decision to to um, begin the process of of taking hormone therapy. Oh heavens! Uh, how much time you got? Well, <clears throat> I uh, came out a little over three and a half years ago, and I only began my uh, hormonal transition a little over three years ago. Okay. So yeah, it was about uh, late September. So yeah, just about three years. Mm -hmm. Um, as to how I made the decision, well, that, is, that part of the decision was very, very easy. The first time I walked into my doctor's office, I knew exactly why I was there. Um, and the, the difficult part was actually coming out to myself and admitting to myself that um, I'm actually a woman and there was a mistake made somewhere along the way. Right. So, yeah, I, I, I came about at an interesting turning point when it comes to treating trans patients because I don't know how many of you know this, but just last year in last May, the designation for what we fall under in the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual um, that the um, APA uses, it changed from gender identity disorder to gender dysphoria, which is the classification that we're talking about today. And one of the major components in the differentiation between the two diagnoses is that with gender dysphoria, you no longer have the sort of gatekeeper model, or at least it's no longer as harsh as it was before. So I think you spoke about having um, a recommendation for a one year um, real, what was called a real life test prior mm -hmm. to uh, prescribing hormones that no longer exists. Oh, okay, fact, I didn't. Um, yeah, in fact, um, it has moved even further. You no longer need the letter from or the approval of a mental health clinician for uh, to begin hormone therapy. Most doctors who are following the WPATH, the World Professional Association for Transgender Health Standards of Care Seventh Edition Guidelines, which is pretty much the de facto what you should reach for to to deal with this population, um, they're following what's called an informed consent model. So uh, a patient can potentially walk into a general practitioner, get referred to an endocrinologist, although a general practitioner should be able to, with some, some knowledge and, and experience or some knowledge and, and education, prescribe these medications um, and not have to have a mental health professional be involved. Would you, um, is that something that you would recommend to any patient who you are counseling though to just go into their routine, you know, primary care physician's office, or would you recommend that they see someone who's got a bit more experience in the use of these hormones? I, I would definitely recommend to go see someone who has a little bit more experience. Yeah. My specific situation, I had my entire 
transition through um, my insurance, Kaiser Permanente. Um, that was very unique, especially at that time, because most insurance providers in the United States would blanket exclude any type of trans coverage. Um, it has only been in the last year or so that um, myself and a group of others here in California have fought that to success. We finally have uh, organizations such as Kaiser, Anthem Blue Cross, and Medi-Cal covering most of these services up to and including gender confirmation surgery. Um, I hate the term SRS, that's just me. Okay. But um, for me, it was, I, I was very fortunate because the endocrinologist that I came across, um, she has been with Kaiser for a couple of years, but prior to that, she was with um, USC Health. And she actually was the one who started their uh, trans health clinic on site because up until her, um, all the trans women were lumped in with the HIV patients, which I can, pro you can probably understand how problematic that would be. Mm -hmm. So she's had some experience in cross hormone therapy or hormone replacement therapy, as, as most uh, in the trans community call it. Um, so she she kind of knew where to start me off. Um, not many of my um, sisters have had that good fortune. A lot of them have gone through either DIY because of lack of insurance coverage. They've gone through insurance coverage sporadically where they're facing doctors or clinics where they have no experience and they're trying to prescribe as they would for a postmenopausal woman. Mm -hmm. um, or they're just prescribing wacky dosages at wacky intervals. So um, I've had a fairly smooth transition in that regard, but I can speak for everyone in the community and a lot of them that I've talked to that I can speak for have had a rough patch of it. So walk us through that. Now that we are in this informed consent model, um, walk us through that, that document that you had to have signed. Um, were, was that something overwhelming? Was that something that you... Well, it, it wasn't even really a document that I had to sign. Um, oh. For, for me, like I said, I started right at the turning point. So I still went through the old process of seeing a mental health professional and being referred to an endocrinologist from there and going through that process. So, but I, I've, you know, assisted many people in my community in um, their transition and getting started there. And for them, for example, the, um, the St. John's Clinic, um, St. John's uh, Child and Wellness Clinic, um, they have an excellent transgender program that they just started this year. Uh, and they operate exactly on that, on the informed consent model. So example, for example, a patient would come in for the first time, um, visit with the care coordinator who would kind of walk them through and have them explain in their own words what this is that they want to get into and how, what, what, uh, what effects they're expecting and if they understand the long-term uh, effects of this exposure. And then they see a doctor, they get their blood drawn. Um, once the levels are checked, they come back for a second visit and they get their prescription. Mm. So um, which hormones did you start with when you first started? Um, my doctor offered me um, pretty much as far as um, estrogen, she offered me a, a couple different choices because obviously as, as you explained, there's oral, there's um, oral sublingual, there's the patch, there's, uh, we don't really use estrogen creams, they're not really effective. Um, and then there's the intramuscular. And I wanted to do oral because I wanted to be an agent of my own change. So I wanted to have that, you know, yeah. physical um, taking a pill every day right. type of thing. Um, and I wasn't too keen on needles. Mm -hmm. But what I found out, uh, she started me on, on very low dosages of both spironolactone and uh, and uh, estrogen. Um, my initial estrogen was, uh, oh heavens, Premarin, there we go. Um, and she started me off on the lowest dosage and we slowly checking levels every, I think, month or two, uh, we would increase. And what we found was that <clears throat> I have an amazingly good liver and as such, it was producing a very high volume of sex hormone binding globulins. So the estrogen wasn't really taking effect and we weren't really seeing levels increase. Mm -hmm. So after about, I think, seven or eight months, I switched to estradiol valerate, um, 20 milligrams uh, every two weeks. And that kind of did the trick. That did it. <laughs> but um, as far as spironolactone, I took uh -huh. that all the way up until, I believe, 
two or three weeks prior to general confirmation surgery. Um, and that knocked my testosterone into the basement. So, so what were some of the uh, effects which you noticed within the first six months of taking the hormones? Well, let me preface it with this. In the community, we have a wonderful saying when it comes to hormone therapy and what to expect. Um, it's called, your mileage may vary. Mm. So uh, depending on, you know, so many different factors, your genetics, your age, your predisposition, whatever it may be, um, you're going to get very, very, very different results. And unfortunately, as you stated in many times, uh, many times during the presentation, there isn't a whole lot of data to rely on as to what medication, what dosage would be the most effective for a given individual. Um, but specifically in my case, um, you know, we rely on so much on uh, looking at the physical changes, changes in you know, breast size, changes in skin texture, changes in body hair, things like that, that many times, and I really hear this in, in discussions about hormone therapy, we're not really talking about uh, brain chemistry changes. We're not talking about the effects of that. We're not talking about emotional changes. Mm -hmm. um, for me, one of the first things that happened was, and this was probably within the first two weeks to a month, I completely lost any um, scent to myself. So I didn't have, you know, you have, you have a certain odor to yourself, mm -hmm. um, especially when you sweat, a certain secretion. Mm -hmm. um, that completely neutralized, which was really bizarre. Mm -hmm. um, then I would say the second thing that I noticed was the softening of the skin. Um, those who are cisgender, so who are not trans, cisgender um, males, um, who do not go through hormone therapy as trans women, they obviously have thicker skin, thicker, rougher skin. So that's one thing I noticed that my skin definitely felt a lot softer. Um, I did notice some breast tissue growth, but that really didn't kick in until we started the uh, injectables. And even then it wasn't um, that impressive. Some of the data coming out of the Papillon Clinic, um, Christy McGinn's clinic, who's a, a surgeon and treats trans patients in Philadelphia is that uh, most trans women, uh, over, I believe, 80% in her study, do not develop past 10 or stage 2 as far as breast development. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, hormones are great, but you're not really going to see a whole lot. And that's, side note, why I'm working so hard with um, certain health insurance companies to cover breast augmentations, not as breast augmentations, but as breast reconstruction. Um, but specifically to my case, and this is kind of what I was alluding to with the emotional effects, one thing that I noticed, and this has been fairly similar with a lot of people that I've talked to in the community, about between two to six months, and again, it varies per person, but all of a sudden, and this goes both directions, both male to female and female to male, you start to really lose your coping skills. Um, things that otherwise wouldn't really affect you start affecting you. Things that you would be able to brush off or things that you would be able to deal with all of a sudden end your world for that day. Um, like I jokingly say to people, there were months when I would cry at a, pe a Pepsi commercial. So <laughs> it's, I'm, I'm not kidding. So I mean, it really, hormones have an amazing effect and um, I, I really don't think we delved into the brain chemistry aspect of it. And I think that that's going to be where we're going to see a lot of significant changes in cross hormone therapy. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So though that was something which occurred very early on in the process, right? Yes. Very early on and nobody talks about it. Not the endocrinologists, not the mental health therapists, mm. not even folks in the community necessarily. Oh, wow. So. A lot of people, especially on the male to female side, chalk it up to, well, you know, you're taking estrogen, you're a woman now, and not like that is what makes you a woman. Um, but you're, you're going to be more emotional. Well, and it goes beyond that because after a while you can balance out and, and things start to be okay again. Mm -hmm. but, what were some of the um, longer term changes that took a little bit longer of a time? Uh, longer term changes. Well, I definitely noticed fat redistribution and decrease in muscle mass. Um, that definitely was a part of it. Uh, gained a little bit more of a, of a hourglass figure, mm -hmm. um, which was nice. <laughs> um, 
but let me think. One thing that you, I think you spoke about was changes in um, like body hair and, and facial and stuff. Um, as far as body hair, I can definitely uh, concur with that. Um, mine virtually disappeared. What little I had left turned into very, very super fine, translucent, almost little wispy little things, mm -hmm. um, but barely even there. Regarding facial hair, though, I would definitely caution uh, saying that to anyone that that will change. Mm -hmm. That, from my experience and from those that I've spoken to, that really doesn't change. So um, one hidden cost of transition are going to, it's going to be the um, probably hundreds of hours of, of laser hair removal and electrolysis on the facial hair region to neutralize that at considerable expense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so tell us about some of the, the, t the challenges of cost and some of the healthcare related barriers. You'd mentioned that you were fortunate that um, Kaiser was so helpful in terms of payment, but I know that's not true for absolutely everyone. So what are some of the healthcare related barriers? Oh, right. Oh, right. No, it's definitely not true. And, um, you know, I, I work with Kaiser on multiple levels. I, I help them develop their protocols um, on treating trans patients. Um, I'm working with them on a long-term study in conjunction with Emory University and the Veterans Administration. It will be the largest ever um, long-term uh, health study on trans patients and the effects of form of therapies and surgery. So all that, all that missing data for your presentation might be able to fill in a couple of holes there. Great. But when it came to, um, just briefly, when it came to, to Kaiser and insurance coverage, when I started the process, they would see me under mental health just because it was mental health. If it was trans-specific, they, they might have raised an eyebrow. My hormone therapy was covered under basically hormone imbalance medical codes. Mm -hmm. So um, they were still very much exclusionary to the trans population. Um, and gender confirmation surgery wasn't even on the table. They would laugh at you at MS services if you even tried to bring it up. So I worked with the Department of Managed Healthcare and Department of Insurance um, through my working group, which is the Trans Leadership Council. And we got them to issue policy statements, which then um, conformed to the Affordable Care Act um, and assisted us in getting Kaiser to be the first to bend and uh, drop their exclusions. But exactly as you pointed out, we are, those of us who are able to um, get these costs covered under insurance are the very, very few um, and very privileged in that regard. But we're, you know, we've been working on, on providing access for more and more people. So Medi-Cal, for example, was a huge victory because that is basically helping those who are either low or no income uh, mm -hmm. gain access to these services. But even with that said, there is a considerable cost um, involved in transition. Um, if I were to pay for everything um, that I pay for out of pocket and what was covered under insurance, at this point, and I don't think I'm really taking into account everything, I think we'd be over $100,000. Um, if you take into account not just the cost of medications and doctor visits and surgeries, but you take into account the cost of um, laser uh, hair removal, you take into account the cost of a wardrobe reboot, you take into account mm -hmm. the cost of um, just everything else that goes along with document changes. Um, there's, there's just so much, and it just is overwhelming and prohibitively expensive. So. The last couple of years, exactly with pointing out Laverne Cox on the cover of Time magazine, it is the transgender tipping point. Um, we're achieving victories where we haven't achieved victories before, both in legal, both in medical and social um, spheres, where we really, really need it to be able to provide access to these to these services and this care for, for all of us. That's great. Well, let me um, transition now to a period of Q and A with the audience. So, That's for audience. <laughs> yeah, we will uh, pivot the camera a little bit so you can see everyone. And um, so, does anyone have any questions for Cadence? I should say, I should rephrase that. What questions do you have for Cadence? Hi, Cadence. Thanks so much for being with us. This is really uh, a talk. My question is, so 
if we intend to go into the like as a healthcare provider, not specifically focusing on trans medicine, what steps do you think we could take if somebody walks through the door um, to make you more comfortable or, or to not make some of the mistakes that maybe people made along the way for your journey? Um, if we're not, you know, specifically focusing on this subset of medicine. Well, first things first, it, regardless of whether you're focusing on this or not, we're more than likely going to walk through the door. Um, and more than likely, in most cases, you're not going to know unless we disclose. Uh, the first assumption of a medical provider is that they're going to somehow receive some sort of training that makes it so that when a trans person walks through the door, immediately their cultural competency um, handbook opens up and they know exactly what to do. That's not the case. The idea is to treat everyone the exact same way and make sure that you're treating every patient with that in mind that um, you might be treating someone who is trans. I don't know what specific field you're, you're interested in going into, but um, for example, not using gender pronouns um, right off the bat with any of your patients, it's unnecessary. Saying Mr. or Mrs. or Ms., it's absolutely unnecessary. Um, recognizing the fact that not every patient that you're gonna have is going to um, look like me and you can assume a pronoun. So there are a lot of folks in the trans community who do not uh, fit on one or the other end of the, of the binary spectrum of male, female, or man, or woman. So there's gonna be people somewhere in the middle. So recognizing the need for gender neutral pronouns is very, very important. Um, and also make sure that when you're, when you're treating someone who is trans, who has disclosed that information to you, um, you're not asking them any inappropriate questions. Basically, if you're not gonna ask your cisgender patients the question, you shouldn't be asking your transgender patients that same question. Does that make sense? Yeah, so some of the questions might be like, what's in your pants? You know, you would never ask that to, to a cisgender person. Right. Or, yeah. Like for example, um, you know, every time I visited my doctor for probably a good two and a half years, um, they would remind me that I need to get a pap smear. Well, that's fantastic, but it um, doesn't really apply. At least it, well, it does now, but it didn't apply then. So things like that, it's, it's important. Um, being able, though, to talk to a trans man, so basically someone who was assigned female at birth, um, but is now um, identifying as male or, or man. Um, being able to talk to them and say, you know, it is time for a pap smear. Yes, they might identify as a man, but they still anatomically um, possess the organs that that would require, or vice versa, a trans woman who would require a prostate exam. Um, so these are these are definitely important things that um, you need to you need to acknowledge. And by the way, one other thing I wanted to throw out there, um, like your presenter said, I've, I've done about five hundred or so uh, trans one-on-one -one type trainings for various classrooms and boardrooms and not so much rooms. Um, so one of the ground rules that I have is please ask the questions. Um, there's no such thing as a stupid question. I'd rather you ask me and get that answered here today in a professional, almost clinical setting, rather than um, you have a whoops moment with the client, because that could be hugely problematic. So who else? Nothing's off limits here, William. Nothing's off limits, go for it. So um, do you have like uh, resources where those who are unable to uh, afford like Say, I've, I've met a lot of undocumented transgender mm -hmm. um, uh, patients in my field of work back in the day. And, you know, they were always looking for some type of resource. So your community center offers that type of resource for, for someone that doesn't have the means or whatnot. And, like, as far as, um, you, know, uh, you know, family counseling and as well as going through the process. Well, our community center is not, um, it's not a typical drop-in center, so we have very focused specific services. Um, the only thing that is drop-in for, for our um, populations is the HIV testing. Um, but with that said, 
I know, I think I mentioned earlier, St. John's Family and Wellness, um, they definitely operate on a, on a sliding scale, um, low cost. And I don't quote me on this, but I do believe that they do have services for um, undocumented folks. And that's very important to point out that there is a very, very, very large intersection of um, trans women and those who are undocumented. Um, a, lot of, a lot of them come to this country simply because of the fact that they face persecution or worse in their home countries. Um, but other than that, I know Star, uh, both in the Valley and here in Hollywood, um, Bienestar offers services specifically to those populations. And also the um, organization that was formerly known as the LA Gay and Lesbian Center, which is now LGBTLA, they finally included us, only took 37 years. Mm -hmm. But um, LGBTLA also offers specific services that I, um, I, I know the, um, there's some groups that, that um, are open to undocumented folks. In fact, they don't even really care. They never even ask about um, that status. And I believe there are some support groups, therapy groups that are. I don't know specifically about medical treatment, though. So that I would probably turn you to St. John's before anything else. Hello, thank you for answering the questions. I'm going to try to grow off the question that was asked earlier. Um, as a student pharmacist, my question would be, is it appropriate, would it, would, it, um, would it make the patient uncomfortable if when dispensing these medications, we asked if all their concerns have been addressed and if they would feel comfortable speaking to it so that we could make appropriate referrals or uh, consult them specifically for um, questions that they may have or specific to the process of the medication that may be necessary for that patient. I don't know if I, if I made my question clear. Crystal clear. Um, I can answer that in one very simple way. The way you just described that is the way you would ask any patient, whether they're trans or cisgender. Um, and by the way, I don't know if everyone knows, again, what I'm saying when I say cisgender. Just like straight is to gay, cisgender is to trans, so it's, it's the majority. If your sex assigned at birth matches your gender identity or correlates with it, you're cisgender. But um, that's a question you would ask any cis patient, so absolutely that's appropriate. Um, although I will say hopefully, hopefully, um, by the time a patient reaches the pharmacy, they've already gone through that with their primary care physician or endocrinologist, and um, they, they kind of know what they're getting into otherwise. That's a bigger problem than, yeah. Right. I, I don't know if that answers your question. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Hi. Um, we talked about how the, like a year ago or however long ago, it was, it was necessary to talk to a mental health professional before starting the treatments, um, and now it's no longer necessary. Um, do you think that it's usually beneficial that like as a general, you really, you're breaking up. Oh, what? Uh, sorry, you were breaking up a little bit. Oh, okay. Sorry. Um, like as a, like for a family doctor, for example, um, do you think, cause you talked about how it'd be good to talk, go to, a um, like a physician that has more experience with this, but do you right. think how important do you think the role is of a mental health provider? Since it's not required anymore. So if you look at the designation differences between gender identity disorder, which is, was classified as a mental disorder, and gender dysphoria, um, under gender identity disorder, you had a diagnosable condition that needed to be treated. Under gender dysphoria, you still have a condition that needs to be treated, but that's not what the mental health provider's role is to treat that. Their role is to make sure that there aren't any other um, issues, any other comorbidities that are in place, mental health comorbidities, um, that might hinder the successful transition of that patient. So um, whatever else might be going on, that's what they need to focus on and leave the gender dysphoria component to the medical professionals. Um, now, granted, even though the new model calls for informed consent, and it calls for uh, a medical doctor, an endocrinologist, or a primary care physician to be the one that guides the patient along that path. Um, it is still highly recommended. And most, most trans folks who have access to mental health services do access those services. 
So it is highly recommended that you, that you see at least an MFT or LCSW um, or a psychologist if they're available. Um, but again, there's, there's another aspect that is problematic because historically, we as a community viewed the mental health profession as a gatekeeper. And we had to do the exact right song and dance for them to be able to get hormone therapy. There was a long, long period under gender identity disorder where if you were a trans woman and you were not attracted to men, so you were not identifiable as heterosexual, um, they would not allow you to go on hormone therapy. So that stigma is kind of starting to erode, but it's gonna take a long while. And it's really important, and by the way, if you want, please all of you write this down. I mentioned it earlier, um, WPATH, uh, W-P-A-T-H um, dot org. Uh, you can download the Standards of Care seventh edition for free, and that will be a, almost a perfect how-to guide on um, both for the mental health field and for the medical field on how to treat trans patients, what are the currently um, best practices as far as protocols and such. So that, that should be a pretty good guideline for you. Unfortunately, a lot of mental health professionals are still operating off of the sixth or even fifth edition, which is a completely, it's a night and day difference. Thanks. My pleasure. So I think we've got time for one more question. All right. Sorry, one more from back here. B building off of that, um, the difference between the gender identity, is identity disorder and the gender dysphoria, what, what is your take on that? Was that, I mean, it, it seems like you think that that was a positive change and, and I guess what would you prefer to have happened or in like, I guess in a perfect world, would there be no um, DSM diagnostic criteria or would there be some and how would it look or just if you could comment on your opinion on that would be really great thank you wow you just asked the sixty four thousand dollar question um so there's a there's a lot of controversy about um, having a diagnosis in the dsm in the first place gender identity disorder the, the the leap from gender identity disorder to gender dysphoria which took nearly 25 years to actually finally get there um, is definitely a step in the right direction, but I don't think in 2014 it was enough of a step in the right direction. Um, it's a double-edged sword because although those of us in the community who are diagnosed with this would like to see it removed from the DSM as any type of mental health stigma, um, at the same time, if it's removed from the DSM or removed from any type of um, medical diagnoses, um, then insurance companies might not be covering it. So there's, there's that kind of trade-off. Um, I'm, I'm interested to see where the next step is going to be for the DSM-6, which obviously is a ways off. But in the meantime, the, the WPATH guidelines have, have kind of filled that gap. Uh, it's taken the edge off the stigma. Having informed consent where patients are given back their self-agency is probably the most important step. Um, because honestly, by the time a trans patient comes to you as a, as a medical professional, uh, they're not coming to you to figure out what the problem is. They, they know what the problem is. In fact, they know what the solution is. And they just want you to help them medically and not try to figure out for them whether this is what they really should be doing or shouldn't be. Um, trust me, it is by far, and I'm not overstating this, the toughest decision you will make in your life because with the social stigma that most trans folks face, um, the economic disparities that we face, the, the hate crime statistics and violence that we face, um, deciding to, uh, realizing that, that some mistake was made at your birth and, and, and deciding to make a change on that, there, it doesn't get tougher than that. You're risking losing absolutely everything, including your own life, unfortunately. So by the time they're sitting in your chair, sitting across from you telling you, this is why I'm here today, um, don't minimize that. Embrace that and help them work with it. Well, thank you so much, Cadence. Let's give her a round of applause for, for joining us today. Well, so it's um, great to meet you. Hopefully we can have um, more sessions like this um, in years to come. So thanks so much and we'll sign off. All right. Thanks.
Bye, everyone.